and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Roger and Serena from Canada. Roger and Serena are a very inspiring couple that got married quite early in their life. Serena is originally from Italy and Roger from Canada. She moved with her whole family to Canada when she was 16 years old and now she is a doctor in sociology. Roger went to university too and he worked for quite a long time as a salesperson in a software company. They also spent some time in Heidelberg. That's how we got to know them. If you want to find out more about unpopular people and our project, visit our website www.unpopularpeople.com. There you can also find the services for our one-on-one -on -one sessions, which are affordable and fair. And you can also find the donate button if you want to support us. For questions, please send us a message. We're looking forward to hearing from you. You can also support us by subscribing to our podcast and subscribing to our newsletter. Thank you very much. And now have fun with this interview. All right, my dear friends. Thank you very much for taking this time today to have a little interview with us. Um, I wanted to have you on our podcast for since we started, to be honest. Like when I when I um, thought about this whole project and I thought about people that should be um, on on this on the show. Let's call it our show. Um, uh, I thought about you. Uh, there was were some people in my head, um, but you were definitely one of them. So I'm very happy that you're here today and you, that you take the time for us because I know you're really busy and uh, so yeah that's very cool thank you so much for so far so um, let's start with our first question so the people um, get to know you a little bit uh, maybe about your background so let us know you can start whoever wants to start um, let us know how did you uh, where were you born and how did you grow up okay you want me to go first all right so I was born in Italy in a city called Genova um, and I grew up Basically, in the outskirts of Milan, and uh, then there was a big break in my life because my my dad actually had an opportunity to work abroad. So when I was 16, we moved to Canada, and uh, we moved to Ottawa first, uh, where I was hanging out with uh, a bunch of other Italian families, and my dad was working for the Canadian government uh, in collaboration with another company. And um, eventually I went to university, which is where I met this guy. <laughs> he was, so I was going to pass. Yeah, so I was born on uh, a rock in the middle of the Atlantic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland. Uh, uh, and um, in a small town called Stephenville that was previously a, a, a U.S. Uh, Air Force base and during the Cold War. So it was kind of an interesting town because it really only had one industry, uh, pulp and paper, uh, which since has closed. So mm -hmm. from the, the town that I remember that was pretty vibrant when I was growing up uh, in a small town, uh, it's now even maybe half the size uh, because a lot of people moved away, uh, including me. So uh, I grew up there. I was, it was quite interesting. I went to the school that was quite religious, which was only about 400 meters down the street from my house mm -hmm. because um, my parents wanted me to be quite close because my mom has been in a wheelchair since I was about uh, five years old. Um, mm -hmm. So she was about uh, 26, 27. But my early years, I remember... Uh, sort of her uh, having trouble walking and, and falling a little bit. Uh, and, and that was something that really kind of changed me when I was young. I was very responsible, extremely responsible when I was young because I had to help take care of my mom from the age of five or six. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was an interesting way to grow up. But I don't think, you know, we weren't rich. My dad worked for the telephone company uh, and That uh, gave us a certain uh, comfort level for uh, finances, but we definitely weren't rich. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did fairly well at school, so uh, <laughs> I had an opportunity through scholarships to go to uh, a university. I had a few different options, but I ended up following 
a friend of mine who went to Ottawa the year before, and I went to uh, Carleton University, and that's where I met Serena. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a synopsis of our early life. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And uh, hello from my side as well for all the listeners. Um, yeah, um, both stories, both childhoods, very interesting, I think. Um, so, but first I want to ask you, uh, Serena, um, how was it uh, moving with 16 years old from Italy to Canada? Um, how did you feel? How was it for you to have to start completing completely new um, when you are a teenager? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Thanks for asking it. You know, it was such an interesting process because um, my dad had promised us to move to Canada a bit earlier when I was 14, but then that trip fell apart. So I had had the opportunity to think about what my life would be like in Canada. And of course, I, as a teenager, I had made this massive dream in my head. I thought it was going to be like the coolest thing, like cowboys and loggers and like great <laughs> nature and all these amazing sparkling cities and it was going to be awesome and the coolest people that I was going to meet. It was going to be super vibrant and exciting. <laughs> and then we actually moved and we moved to Ottawa, which is a very small city and it's a government town. So it's very boring. Or it was then, at least, yeah. Well, it was, yeah, it's not yeah. as much anymore. But at the time, it was very quiet and very small. So I was used to living in Milan with a bunch of crowds, a lot of people and a lot of friends. And all of a sudden, I found myself at 16 in a country where I didn't understand the language. <laughs> that was kind of like dispersed, not a lot of people in a high school that I didn't understand. And it was really overwhelming. So it It was a tough first year. And the other strange thing was also that uh, my dad was there with a bunch of uh, other colleagues. So every colleague of his brought his family. So there were a bunch of Italian teenagers that didn't really like each other, but they were forced to be with one another. <laughs> We didn't really have any alternatives. <laughs> so the first year was really not what I expected and a little boring and we couldn't do anything because in Canada... Uh, you can't go to bars until you're of major age. So you need Which to be 19. 19. So, 18 if you cross the river. Right. In so I had just left Italy where I could go to discos, I could go to bars, I could meet guys, I could do anything I wanted. And all of a sudden, life got really boring. <laughs> well, a lot of times, somewhat like COVID-19 <laughs> in your parents' apartment. So. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that. So the first year was hard, also because I couldn't speak any English. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. There's a great learn. story about how she spoke English for the first <laughs> first time in a class. Uh, yeah, that was funny. Tell so, us the story. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so the story basically is that if you're an immigrant person in a new country, people associate the ability to speak with intelligence. Uh, so I had gotten to a point where I could understand perfectly, but I didn't really have the courage to speak yet. Uh, and uh, we were doing group work that was like, you know, forced upon us. A professor put us in this group and was telling us to do an analysis of Shakespearean uh, plays. I think we were analyzing the mousetrap, you know, that metaphor. Anyways, yeah. so one kid was being very kind and he was taking the time to slowly explain to me what we were supposed to be doing. And I was listening. And then this other guy intervened and basically told him to stop talking to me because I was stupid. Uh, because there was no point, really. It was just a waste of time. So I got pissed off, and I started speaking English. It was great. Oh, okay. <laughs> and she didn't speak, like, three words. She, she like, spoke, I just, like, you know, paragraph after yeah, paragraph. Yeah, I just looked at him, and I said, do you think that just because I don't speak your language, I'm stupid? That's a bit of a stretch, don't you think? And it was like, oh, my gosh, wait. <laughs> 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 yes, and that was a good moment because after that, you know, I kind of forced myself to kind of get over being shy and I tried to speak a bit more. Yeah, and yeah. you got to meet guys a little bit. Yeah, like, that was a bit easier yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. before we get to the meeting guys thing, um, I wanted to ask you, Serena, do you have any siblings and uh, how did they react to the, to the change in their life? Ah, yes. So I have a sister. We are very close in age. She's a year and a half older than me. Her name is Pia Luisa. And same thing, right? We got to Canada and she was just as bored as I was. And we had each other, though. And because we were so close, that really helped. We were just, 
you know, each other's ally. So that that was great. And you'll see that my she, sister she has a kind of a, an, an interesting important part role. of the story later when we talk about how Roger and I met. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, Liza, you should ask Roger how we met. <laughs> yeah, but first I want to know a little bit more about Roger's childhood. Uh, you said <laughs> it was uh, like a responsibility uh, for you because of your mom in the wheelchair. And do you have uh, brothers or sisters? And... Um, Yeah, how do you describe the, um, can you describe the responsibility? So how was the life back then? How did the day look like? Sure, yeah. No, I was an only child. Uh, my uh, my parents were actually, it was a bit dangerous for my, my mom was diagnosed when she was about 13, 14 with, uh, actually this has a Heidelberg tie-in uh, with Friedrich's ataxia. And Friedrich's ataxia is named for a Dr. Friedrich, mm. who was at the University of Heidelberg, Universitat de uh, no, Heidelberg Universitat. Um, and so um, it was sort of like multiple sclerosis or uh, um, mm. other different uh, neurological diseases. So she was losing motor control and, um, and, and her balance. So I had a really good childhood I mean my my mom was extremely uh, loving and I was because she couldn't uh, get out of the house so much she was uh, like I was a big part of her world um, but I, I actually had two moms almost because my her mom my grandmother was uh, really took a lot of uh, opportunity to help my mom uh, with raising me and take some of the Uh, the pressure is off of my mom and dad uh, because my dad was working and traveling a lot with the telephone company. Uh, so my my grandparents ended up probably doing at least a third of my uh, upbringing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was very close uh, to my grandmother especially and later on to my grandfather as well. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, that was a big part of my uh, my early years. Uh, my my grandmother always uh, as well spoiled me a little bit so I was a bit of a chubby kid uh, uh, <laughs> she would always hide chocolates and, and my dad and her would have fights around uh, there was a drawer in our basement in their little apartment where she would always put chocolates for me and I would uh, I was getting fat so <laughs> so when uh, when I was about 12 years old my dad said listen you have to I don't care what it is, but you had to do some sport. Uh, so I, I, I went into judo. He took me uh, and I started judo. And then I actually uh, uh, went to judo for a number of years and competed. And uh, when I was 16, I placed third in Canada for uh, the Canada Games for uh, one of the weight class oh, wow. for, mm -hmm. for judo. So it was, it got me in a lot better, <laughs> lot better shape. The irony was, in order for me to fight, I was fighting in a, cla a weight class that was heavier than I was used to. So for the <laughs> for the three months leading up to the Canada Games, I had I couldn't eat regular food. I had to eat ice cream and everything to try to gain. <laughs> so my grandmother was kind of right. <laughs> Oh, poor awesome. guy having having to eat ice cream all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough life. I tough tell life. You. <laughs> Yeah, it's very oh, interesting, yeah. yeah, because you both have like um, different struggles in the background. Like uh, I think for for Serena, more like the finding your identity to this new place and like uh, getting settled uh, in a, in a new environment and everything. And for you, Roger, like the um, like being the only child and um, kind of feeling this responsibility for your for your mom. Um, so um, I want to start with uh, you, Serena, first, just to switch back and forth. <laughs> um, so what what you what advice could you give others? Maybe Maybe that are struggling with uh, something similar you know they come to a new place and uh, we heard this before with people um, uh, that came from South Africa to New Zealand or something like this and they had troubles finding their identity so what advice could you give others to especially in this age hmm. well that's a really complicated and layered question um, I mean I think one of the things about identity is that I think we stress a bit too much about who we are and who we want to be and I think At the end of the day, life happens to us. And I think who you become is a process that is active and passive. So I think the first piece of advice would be to uh, be courageous and not be afraid of uh, doing things that terrify you. Uh, 
So moving to a new country, if you have an opportunity, do that because it's probably going to be for the rest of my days, the best experience I've ever had. Yeah, for sure. Me too, when I moved to Germany. Yeah. So we Absolutely. both got to experience yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. And the other thing is that not to stress too much about who you are because it doesn't stay like that. Your life changes and who you are constantly changes with you. So you may not necessarily love what you are at that moment, but don't worry because just six months on the line, you're going to be a completely different person. Yeah. So take it as it comes. Think of it as a river. Yeah. I think that would probably be a good piece of advice. If I could give that piece of advice to me at 16, to stress a little less about what other people think and to try to always do the things that I think others expect of me, I would like to be able to give myself that advice. Yeah. So travel and don't stress about who you are. Yeah. What about you, Roger? What advice can you give in the age from your background? Yeah, I think I, I, I kind of took my own advice, but it took me a long time. Uh, my, Like I said, I was quite responsible. I actually enjoyed my childhood and, and wouldn't change really a thing, even though there were those kind of uh, special challenges with my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, because then when I went away, I ended up being quite a quite a good student, uh, quite a good kid. And for a long time, all through high school and things like that, when other people were smoking pot, I was like, oh no, that's wrong. And, and things like, uh, and, and so, yeah. So at, at that point I was, I was very good, but that actually did put me into a good stead. When I started working, um, I got a lot of really good experience and a lot of really good uh, opportunities, especially after I went to work for a software firm. And that was still in my late 20s. Uh, and I got to be a, a country manager with them because I had gray hair and I seemed older by the time <laughs> I was like 28, 29. Um, so, so it really gave me a lot of opportunity that way. But... Eventually, I felt like I had too much responsibility, right? I had taken on so much. And when we moved from Canada to Germany, I insisted on selling everything. We had a house in, in Canada, and I really felt like we needed to uh, divest ourselves of uh, all these responsibilities mm -hmm. like mortgages and things like that. And we went and we did the two years in Heidelberg, um, really by renting and having much less responsibility responsibility and it really kind of got that out of our system because mm -hmm. I think if you go too far one way with the responsibility or too far with no responsibility you always try to come back into equilibrium mm -hmm. uh, on those things but until you have the other you don't know that the where the middle is mm -hmm. I, I think you need to That's a good you need to have it. a little bit of uh, fun in your life to balance off the responsibility yeah. so great, great yeah too. Yeah, very great advice. Thank you very much for this. Um, both of you, of course. And um, so, okay, now we finally want to meet. <laughs> We're nearly there. You came to, you came to um, uh, Canada. You already were there. So when did you guys meet and uh, how? <laughs> okay, so this is a cool story. Yeah. So Roger's dad came to visit him in Ottawa. And Roger was a student, but he didn't have a job. So he encouraged him to find a part-time job as he was still a student. He ripped a number off and he said, if you haven't called them and you don't have a, an interview by next week, I'm cutting you off, basically. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It can be a little stern sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, and the same thing happened to me and my sister. So my sister was walking around campus and found exactly the same poster with the phone number saying, job for students give us a call. And so she got the number and then she said, hey, apparently they're hiring a bunch of people so you can be hired too. Mm -hmm. So my sister and I applied and Roger applied to the same mm -hmm. job. And you probably know about this. Every university has uh, students that call people that have graduated, the alumni, and they ask for donations of money to raise uh, the budget of the university. Right. So that was the job we had. Yeah. We were telemarketing. It's a very North American thing. It's a very North American thing. Where you call for donations. Yeah. So yeah. universities are always private. So they always ask for private money. And we were those poor bastards <laughs> that call these people and say, hi, we're calling from Carlton University. Would you like to donate to build this money. building? <laughs> so we can build a new building. <laughs> 
It was not a good job. It's not a thankful job. <laughs> yeah. Not a good job. But, you know, we had a good my, time. It was my first yeah. sales job. <laughs> That's true. And so Roger, here's where it gets really fun and interesting. Yes. Roger was actually interested in my sister. He wanted to date my sister, Pia Luisa. So he decided to talk to the other sister. Now, you need to understand that I was very skinny at the time, and I was a goth. So I was all like black hair, piercings. Black. She maybe maybe weighed uh, about uh, forty five kilos, maybe. Yeah, I was really tiny. She was really tiny. <laughs> and my sister was a voluptuous Italian with the long brown hair, and you know, gorgeous, and a little bit more outgoing at the time. Well, I don't know about that. Not more no, outgoing. Not more outgoing. She, anyway, had, she had. Let's just call them more attributes. Yeah, she she was shapely. <laughs> let's say shapely. <laughs> So when Roger befriended me, it was actually because he was trying to figure out if he could be with her. Yeah. Now, fortunately, <laughs> my sister had a boyfriend at the time. So after a few months, <laughs> but, but we were we were being friends. We we uh, we would meet uh, before our shifts in a little cafeteria right uh, right in the building that we were working in. But we we would religiously meet uh, an about before, an hour before, yeah, two hours out. before, yeah. And so the, our our friendship really developed over September, and we didn't date until December. Right. So yeah, it took so a while. It gave us first a, because I wasn't really sure if he was interested. In and it. she thought I was too too and the slow. And thing is that poor thing. It was okay. Italians have a completely different rhythm when it comes to meeting people. Right. They're very friendly. They're very in your face. They can look at you and know if you're interested. And there's all this signaling that happens if you're interested in a person. So at 16, before, like two years earlier, I had game in Italy. I knew exactly what to do. And then I came to Canada and all my signals were completely off. Canadians were much more polite yeah, and slow. I found Canadians to be very introverted, very quiet, very calm, not exactly outgoing. I mean, it's completely different culture. So, I mean, I just... I felt I was completely out of my depth, right? So I also had become very insecure and I didn't really know how to approach guys because I figured I had fallen on my face a few times. So it had gotten a little complicated. So with him, I was taking my time because I didn't want to scare him off. Right. <laughs> but she was getting a little bit uh, little bit impatient by December as well. Yeah, by so. December, I was like, I don't think this guy likes me. I mean, it's been three months for the love of God. Yeah. <laughs> But finally, we organ actually, how did it happen? We organized a party together, yeah. remember? Yeah. And after that party, you said, let's go out for a movie, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. I was like, is this a date? Is it not a date? I'm not sure. And then it was a date. Yeah. yeah. And that'll be, it'll be 30 years ago oh in, in, well, a few months in yeah. this, this year, in December of this year, will be 30 years since we started dating. Right. So we were so, really young. I was yeah. 18 and he was 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. It's a very long time. Yeah. So um, amazing. Um, yeah, when you see couples um, like you that are for so long time together and everything seems very well. And um, do you have a secret um, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that you can uh, like do it advice for people? How can you handle to be together for so long time? A good relationship. Well, I think the the key is. Uh, Where does she hide the chocolate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's uh, the key is. It, it sounds trite uh, a little bit, but it's communication, right? It's trust and communication, and, and no matter what it is that you have in your life, whether or not it's uh, uh, the way you want to live your relationship, uh, the decision if you want to have children. We don't have children. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the way the finances run, uh, keeping everything completely open, like right from the first day. And it was partially because that's the way my parents had done it. But we, right from the first day we were married, we had one bank account. We never have had any separate bank account. And that was easy. We had like three dollars. We only we only had <laughs> debt anyway. So we were we were signing on. We didn't have anything, so it was easy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we when we got married, we we tried to set ourselves up part of that responsible side that I was talking about before. We didn't even ask for any gifts. We just said, could we get money because we want to buy our first house? And we bought our first house. We were 
22 and 23. Yeah. And we bought our bought our first house. It was a beautiful, we love it. Even in memory, we love it. It's such a it was place. a two bedroom uh, apartment. Uh, it had been repossessed by the bank. And the guy who, we, who had been repossessed, we found out through the other neighbors, had been arrested for flying a plane from Mexico <laughs> with drugs into the U.S., I think. And, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and on our back door, his name was Charles. And on the back door, there was scra- scratched into the door when we bought it was Chaz, which is a way to say Charles in short. Call, Call me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> With somebody's keys, <laughs> so it was. Uh, yeah, that was interesting yeah, as well. Crazy. But yeah, I digress a little bit with the story. But it's really about all of those things that you do. You do them together. You do them as a team. For sure. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that we met each other when we were so young, yeah. and to a certain extent, you grow together, right? Yeah. I mean, you be really become intertwined, and this can play out well or it can play out badly. In our case, I think we were good friends, and we've always been good yeah. friends. I think we zigged and zagged a lot, but we kind of, I guess, through the communication, also through the way we wanted to live our lives, Mm -hmm. we zigged and zagged together sort of thing. So we could have zigged and zagged at the same time and gone apart like this. (laughs) That's true. And we have problems. We've had some serious issues too. Like Life has not always been a bed of roses. We've had some serious issues and... We had to go through some yeah, we did. nasty Yeah, things. I mean, we had some tough times in our marriage and mm-hmm. and got help from great people that yeah. uh, really helped us out through those times. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting, really inspiring. So um, what is, um, <laughs> what? how do you react to people, especially uh, because we uh, try to live the same lifestyle we are friends and we have a bank account since we i don't know like nearly everything uh, we do everything together and um, <laughs> and also when we yeah. when we go somewhere and um, for us it's just like uh, we don't we don't uh, like when when we want to go somewhere and we both like the place where we sh- want to go like it's for us of course we go there together right um, and but sometimes we get um, like we hear people like oh no but I just want to do something with you I just want to do something with you and and people reject you because of this like how did how did you react to like things like this or how do you react to those people yeah, yeah it's a fine line between codependence and a uh, strong friendship relationship mm. I mean, I think fundamentally, every time you have someone that has a problem with you being good together and want to pull you apart from one another, Mm. you should see that as a red flag. Nothing ever good comes of that, in my opinion. (laughs) This is also my professional opinion, because now I'm an expert in relationship (laughs) dynamics. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with being each other's best friends. Uh, I think it becomes problematic if you just cannot do anything without the other. So you need to watch out for still maintaining your own personalities and maintaining your own interests and making sure that you have a life together but a separate life too. And I think we've done that quite well because we have very disparate interests and he likes to do certain things I don't and vice versa. And that's okay. (laughs) I also think it's been been interesting, but we, uh, maybe with the exception of the time we were in Heidelberg, have sort of been social conveners where people mm-hmm. can't come to our house uh, and one of the things that some groups of friends especially in North America I think more uh, have have done is there's the boys get together and the girls get together sort mm-hmm. of thing in, in Italy that's what my so question little... was related to yeah because we experienced uh, the same yeah, um... yeah. yeah I really don't like that it's so, so in Italy she would always talk about the company the yeah. so maybe yeah you can explain well that. I mean Keep in mind also that I, my impression of Italy is Italy is a very young person. Yeah. So I'm not really sure if this is still the case with people becoming older. But the way I remember it is that uh, there's a lot more gender integration. There isn't this idea that boys have to hang out with themselves and girls hang out with themselves. It's always friends that hang out together in mixed company. So I think that's part of my heritage. And that's something that for me works a lot better. Right. Yeah. yeah. So when she moved back to Italy, I went to visit her um, and there's another story that comes out of that, but uh, the the company, the, the group that she was with was really this group of all these guys and girls who weren't all dating each other right no, then, just friends. but they had all, probably <laughs> dated each other at yeah, different points in, in the group. Whereas <laughs> <Which> in, <happens. laughs> where, but in North America, there's especially as we've gotten older, there's still this kind of sense that the guys 
get together a little bit and the girls get together. But I don't know. We've been able to sort of bring a lot of that, bring groups together. And, yeah. and I think people really enjoy being in a mixed group. Uh, yeah, I agree. But they sometimes have to be convinced, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you end up the guys going to a hockey game or yeah. something mm-hmm. like that. And I never really got into any of those types of um, all guy things. Now, I, we both like a guy's trip or a girl's no, trip. Like, no, you play poker with yeah, And I have, a, yeah. I have a group yeah. that plays poker uh, and, and we're all guys. So it is nice to have that every once in a while, but not be the, the norm, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for yeah. this. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, now I want to do a little bit structure because I um, you you bought a house together in Canada, and then um, Serena, you uh, went back to Italy for a job. And can you tell us from this time a little bit the that we understand the history yeah, things? Like, I know it gets really complicated yeah. because so Roger and I met uh, in nine sorry nineteen ninety nineteen ninety. But then my parents, my dad's contract ran out two years later. So my parents loved Roger, but they didn't like the idea of leaving a daughter back in Canada. So they decided that we were all going to return to Italy. So they basically deported me back to Italy for one year. How old have you been then? 20. I was 20. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I didn't really have, I wasn't even of major age. So by law in Italy, you cannot be of major age till 21. So if my parents forced me to go to Italy, I had to. I couldn't really say no. But I got really sneaky because my mom basically figured that I was young and therefore I was going to forget about Roger within three three months. So I made them promise me that if we were still together in a year and if I wanted to go back to Canada on my own, that it was going to be okay. Now... Legally speaking, they had no right to keep me in Italy if they wanted to. But uh, let's just, just say we negotiated this friendly yeah. amendment. Family thing, family business. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm very stubborn. So my mom figured that she was going to be able to change my mind, but it didn't work out. So, so at the end, at the of, end, the end year, of the year, at the end of maybe nine eight, months, nine, nine months that yeah. we've been apart, I came Roger to Italy. came to visit in Italy. And that fall, I moved back to Canada. And I finished university, and then we got engaged shortly after. And mm, then, you're leaving out something. Okay, though. fine. You want to go there? Yeah. You do? Yeah, why not? Okay, sure. So, <laughs> so it gets a little complicated. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, then the, you realize it opens the other can of worms. Are you sure you want to go there? Well, no. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It doesn't really, though. No. Okay, anyway, sure. so, Okay, so there was a beach shark issue. <laughs> Well, not only we, that, but Roger we fought. Came, we, came what kind Sweden. of issue? What kind of issue? Sorry. I have a colleague it's called the Beach Shark, a very good looking man at the beach. It's coming. So, yeah. Which then kind of takes our life in an interesting direction. So, this is an important story. Okay, so Roger came to visit for about a month, and we fought like cats and dogs because we hadn't seen each other for nine months, right? Mm-hmm. So, he went back to Italy, to Canada, yeah. and I stayed in Italy for two more months, and in that two months, I went to the seaside for a vacation where I met this really good-looking guy, and he was like, well, if you're still in love with him, how come you're interested in me? And I was like, shit, <laughs> we have a point. <laughs> So we didn't really do much. Like we just had a little fling. It wasn't even yeah. that serious. But it was enough for me to really worry that maybe what I'd done with Roger wasn't such a good idea. And I hadn't yeah. exactly been a, uh, uh, a choir boy <laughs> back in Canada either. There was uh, a, a girl that I had uh, gone to my kind of graduation from the university uh, with. And, uh, and we had kind of made out as well. So... So I wasn't uh, I wasn't completely blameless in this whole process. No, fair either. enough. But I mean, come on, we were like twenty, we were young, twenty-one. Right, so. What do you expect? Yeah. We were about to make this massive life decision, yeah. and we had to convince both our families that this was going to be the best decision. And at that age, it was really hard to do. So it's not it's not a surprise. So yeah. she moved back to Canada after being at the the seaside, yeah, running all the time, uh, <laughs> trying to impress the beach shark. And I wasn't she, running for the beach shark. Uh, I was running for the angst. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but she got off the plane and she came out through the uh, the exit and I was picking her up and I just about fell over because <laughs> she was so beautiful. I was tanned. She had such fit. a beautiful tan. She, <laughs> and angry. And But she was mad. And, and she, <laughs> she, 
she proceeded to. <laughs> so I got there and I immediately broke up with Roger. He was like, forget it. This is not going to work. I'll finish my university and then I'll go back. But it but didn't work out that way. <laughs> I am not a runner, but I, <laughs> I, decided, I decided in the little short shorts that she was wearing to run that I would go running with her. And I did everything. This is after we broke up. And yeah. maybe we were also still having sex after we yeah, broke up. Yeah, there was a lot of really good, we're not together. <laughs> we're not together, sex. sex. <laughs> uh, and so then we ended up uh, with uh, uh, me chasing her for about 10, 10, days. 10 days, 12 days. It didn't take very long. And I, I convinced <laughs> her yeah, to yeah, take that's me. That's <laughs> but then, of course, you know, the situation was reversed yeah. so that he was angry at me and he didn't want me back. Yeah. So he made me work. <laughs> A little bit, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. well. There anyway, you but it was it all worked oh out. Oh my god, it was such a long time ago. <laughs> so you both you both worked a lot for your relationship. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what you, that's what you were saying earlier. So it's all about communication, and even if there are things coming up that you don't see happening yeah. in the future, because there's always you never know what happens tomorrow. You know, like if you look back three months ago, we we're recording this right now while we are all in quarantine, and um, life can change. And I think it's very important what you did to just like talk about it and being mad at each other it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you find a solution and if you if you think like you want to um, uh, spend uh, time together or spend your life together i think it's it's very very cool what you did um i want to i was talking to a friend earlier today who w had gone through a separation divorce and uh, i was saying yeah we're not making a big deal of it but we are finding that being in quarantine and being isolated like this, it's okay. it's actually pretty okay because we're each other's yeah, best friends. Like each other. <laughs> so it's uh, it, yeah. it's it's not like couples who have been apart and doing their things with their their other friends and now all of a sudden have to spend time together, which is happening maybe for yeah. some people. We're not finding that it's at all. Hard, yeah, yeah, for sure. We still fight, but that's, I know, but that's I yeah. think it's a good thing. Oh yeah, yeah for for the record. I think fighting is very important. Yeah. Because people that say that they are great because they never fight, I mean, I think that's a very bad habit. Yeah. It just bottles things up and it's not really going to be, you know, tenable in the long run. Yeah, true. Yeah. And it's also what you said is, I think when you when you are in a relationship and you, um, uh, you should actually think about a time, like, oh, you know, when you're stuck, I'm quoting here now <laughs> with my fingers. Uh, yeah, yeah. When you're stuck in a place for um, for a, a little while or a longer time, and um, could you sp like spend all the time with like this one person? And if you if you see this is not happening, then you should probably consider the whole thing. And um, it's also okay, yeah. you know, because there's uh, if the one door closes, there's like a lot of doors open. So. Um, yeah so this is very cool anyways um i'm drifting away so i want to actually i want to find out a little bit more about your um, education and your profession you said that you uh, went to university um, roger and uh, you serena as well so um what did you study and um like what is your what is your profession what came out of your studies sure um i went to university to actually do an undergraduate degree and then become a lawyer uh, I, I was uh, so I decided to do a business degree, a Bachelor of Commerce, um, and I specialized in accounting. And so by about the the end of the third year, I was okay uh, at accounting, not not fantastic, and it wasn't something I loved. But uh, they started doing the interviews in the fourth year for jobs and I got one of the jobs uh, at one of the big accounting firms. So that gave me an opportunity to make some money. Uh, and I also didn't know if I really wanted to still be a lawyer. So I uh, decided to go and try accounting and I could always go back to school later if I wanted to. Uh, so I did, um, I worked for accounting firms for about five years. Um, I got laid off uh, from one when there was a downturn in the economy like we're seeing now. Uh, back in, I guess it was back in 94, 95 sort of thing. And, and um, we, uh, at that time, I, I, I uh, bounced around a bit and then I got a job with the government and 
I was still working. I was working for the uh, the head accountant, the controller for the Canadian Army, um, and I was using a piece of software. And I got to meet some of the salespeople uh, for that. And that company ended up hiring me, uh, and that really changed my life because going into high tech uh, and going into sales, I was much better at sales uh, than I had been at accounting. Uh, I, I'm more of an extrovert, so. It made it uh, made it wondering. a good career change for me. So I had a I started there uh, 21 years ago, and uh, they just uh, gave me a package. Uh, I'm calling it my ret- retirement package right now, but I'm only 49, so I'll probably do something else. I just don't know what that is. Uh, but for now, I have some money to uh, to give me an opportunity to to really comfortably look at what I do next as well. Uh, my story is very um, kind of non-linear. <laughs> so I used to joke when, when Ben met me, he would ask me, so what do you do? And I was like, I'm a professional student. <laughs> because I started in university. I did a degree in political science. Eventually. Um, yeah, I changed the major like, I think, four times. I think it was undeclared, then Spanish, then mass communications, mass communications then finally political science. So I had no idea what I wanted to do but in my life. But in our last year, she did extremely well on her thesis in political science. And then I met, while at university, this person who was Italian, and he had basically made a career of being Italian. So he did a degree in comparative literary studies, and then he became a language professor in Italian. And I was like, hey, that's a good idea. I could probably do something like that. So I enrolled in my master's in comparative literary studies. And then I was continuing into a PhD. uh, But then my program closed. They actually shut it down. So I had to transition to another program. And I kind of followed the footsteps of a friend who transitioned to sociology. Very good friend. And I mean, political science and sociology are fairly similar. And I really was missing political science. So I decided to do that, and I ended up doing a doctorate in uh, sociology. Yeah, but it got uh, it got kind of e- elongated by our trip to yes. Germany. Yes, in the middle of my PhD, we went to Germany yeah. for two years, and I didn't do much studying at that time. But. It took her a couple <laughs> of years longer because of that. But we went back to Toronto, and then I finished my PhD. Uh, I worked yeah. as um, a sessional lecturer for a couple of years. And then I got an interview here at Brandon University in this town where we live now, and I got the job. Yeah. So now I'm a professor in sociology, and I've been so for 10 years. And and it's crazy because (laughs) I was just saying I was at this company for almost 21 years. Half of that time, we've lived in this town, uh, Brandon, Manitoba, which is about 60,000 people, so quite small. Ben Um, has seen it. Yeah, and Ben knows it. And I was there. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually quite nice. <laughs> uh, but it, 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 we moved from like uh, Ottawa, which was already what we saw said was a small town, but it's a million people. Yeah. And uh, then Heidelberg, which is a very global city as well, and then to Toronto, which was amazing. Which was amazing. Yeah, a really world class city. To Brandon, which we weren't quite sure about, but we've now lived here ten years and are really, really happy. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, my life has been a series of uh, fortunate uh, mistakes yeah. that somehow panned out. I mean, I don't have anyone in my family that is an academic. I'm the only academic in my family. But I love it. It's a great, it's a you great have, job. Uh, you have an uncle through marriage who's yeah. an academic. But that, yeah, just He's that. a historian, yeah. yeah. But we, uh, we, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but we always seem to fall upwards. Uh We've been very lucky, uh, yeah. and we often talk about this from the point of view, her a sociologist especially, mm. as it's as much about being lucky and being in the right places at the right time. Like that software company, just because I ended up taking a job in the government uh, because mm. I didn't want to be in a typical accounting firm for a while, then I started using the software, and then I got offered this job really financially projected us forward mm-hmm. and with with Serena I mean it's been all these things like the program closing and then going yeah. into sociology yeah. and that ended up being her calling so mm-hmm. you, you every change and like I said I just went through uh, being let go by my company 
every change is an opportunity. It's one door closes, another opens, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, in one way or another, it's interesting. I find that uh, it really does turn into something that maybe in the moment is terrifying and you don't like it. But a few years down the line, when you look back, you realize that it really was an important moment that yeah. opened a lot of opportunities. And uh, it was very much an opportunity to do something else, right? And to think of yourself in new ways. So, yeah. yeah. Change sometimes is terrifying, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Great. Amazing. Um, now we want to hear a little bit from your time in Heidelberg. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you mentioned it already as, uh, in this interview um, for um, several times. So how was the time there? Oh, it was amazing. Okay. So for me, it was a very amazing time and a very scary time. It was amazing because um, I think Roger mentioned earlier, it got us to do something that was very not what we were used to. Uh, we met a bunch of really interesting people that were very into the techno scene. And there was a bit of a subculture around like this. Ben. Right? Like Ben. Yes, like Ben. Exactly. So we lived this blessed life. It was kind of magical where we knew the DJs and they would invite us to these private parties or we would end up on the lists and we would go to where all the cool things were happening. It was almost surreal, mm -hmm. right? This was not the life we had before. We really felt we'd become rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really interesting time. Now, the flip side of that is that I was supposed to be writing my dissertation and I wasn't being a very good student. So I got so far away from my academic career that I almost got kicked out of my program. So it got very close. I could have burned my academic career because of the fact I was uh, doing enough work. And eventually, <laughs> and eventually that was the main reason we left yes. Heidelberg because we had, I think in our minds had the idea that we may stay for about four or five years. Yeah. And by the end of two years, it was getting yeah. hard. I knew I was not going to yeah. be able to finish my program. Yeah. And, I stayed. and it was the best thing possible for me because I yeah. now get to have her as my retirement plan. So <laughs> I make them. Perfect. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, Heide Heidelberg was interesting because it was professionally, it was an incredible opportunity for me because I got there and um, I was running business development for a set of our solutions, more the financial type solutions. Uh, and uh, but I got to travel, I think, maybe to about 22 countries, mm -hmm. multiple times across Europe, Asia. Uh, and it really gave me a, a completely new worldview uh, from a business perspective um, and helped me understand people from so many different uh, uh, cultures. And I remember when we were leaving Ottawa, uh, I was sitting having a drink with one of our friends who was Greek, who had moved from Greece to Canada. And I was saying, I'm really nervous about moving to Germany because uh, – I don't speak German, and uh, he, he had actually lived in Germany. He had gone from Greece to Germany when he was 19 or 20 and lived there. For, he said, Roger, don't worry about it. You're the type of person that will be friendly with everybody. You'll make friends right away. Uh, you'll love Germany. Don't don't worry about it. Any, you go Anywhere you go, you'll, you'll be okay. And, uh, and he was right. And he was so right. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I went all over Scandinavia all through Southern Europe, uh, went to Africa, to South Africa, and were, and people were the same everywhere, basically, right? And that was the thing that when you're from a small town on a rock in the Atlantic, uh, mm -hmm. and that's where you grow up, everybody has been there. My family has been in that same general area since 1700, about 1700. So I've been in North America. My family's been in North America for a very long time, and I didn't know anywhere else. But now to have traveled so much and see so many people uh, and realize that we're all at the core so much more alike than we are different, that was that blew my mind while I was there. Mm -hmm. And then on the non-professional side, I got to meet all these great people who didn't care if I was in my – because I, by then we were in our early 30s. Mm -hmm. Some of these people were in their late 50s, somewhere in uh, – we had Alan's 40th birthday – You were still in your you late teens. Yeah, I was nine, 19, yeah. 18, 19. Yeah. Yeah. 18, 19. 19 yeah. So, I mean, we, we had this group of friends who were more alike than different. 
and they were all ages and all different backgrounds uh, from a nationality. And, and it just, it opened my mind so much. And then we partied a lot too. And, and we're <laughs> very much, epic. very much like rock stars, but I mostly, I think held down my really professional responsibility with also realizing that if I l let my guard down a little bit, it wasn't going to ruin my career. And that was something that was, it actually made me, I think it made me more interesting on the professional side because I was a little less, as they say, buttoned up uh, yeah. after Germany as well. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. It was yeah, that's yeah, very it interesting that Germany, like, as you said, let the button loose up a little bit. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's uh, opposite. Yeah, like people say it's the other <laughs> way around. <laughs> Everybody always says about Germany, if you really want to let go move to germany exactly right no, no. <laughs> well probably probably if you if you have if you get into the same party scene <laughs> no no it, not all of germany but not all of germany but, but we we really got to meet some great people yeah um again don't judge a book by its cover right don't assume that all germans and all of germany is the way that you learned about in all the stereotypes, right? Yes. So, absolutely. Yeah. And how did you keep your, you said you keep, uh, kept your guard up during this time. Um, how did you do this, Roger? And how, Serena, how did you uh, realize, even during a, uh, let's, let's call it a crazy time like this, uh, how did you realize that um, do you, yeah, I mean, you, you like it, but you still want to do something different? And yeah, can you explain this for others, <laughs> maybe? Huh? Well, so the, the magical formula is to be able to hold both sides of your life in a, in a way that doesn't make you have to give up the other, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the great things that we got out of Germany was that, okay, when we were in Germany, I think we went a little crazy, a little too crazy. But after Germany, we realized that we needed quite a bit of crazy in our lives in order mm -hmm. to then be able to be productive and happy in our professional lives. And I think we've kind of made that a way of life, right? So. We play hard and we party hard, but we also work very hard. Yeah. Like you need to be able to party hard and let go and explore that crazy side of you, your normative ties side, in order to be able to be really effective at the expected aspects of your life, the responsibilities, the career, all mm -hmm. the things. Um, and I think we've managed to live a, a life that kind of managed to do a little bit of the expected and quite a bit of the unexpected melded together. And I don't think we could live in any other way. Yeah, and I think yeah. maybe, I mean, um, we, I've always been really uh, quite honest. Um, so even when we were being uh, somewhat crazy, I wasn't saying, oh, no, no, I was at church last night and that's, <laughs> I was there really late, so that's why I'm... Uh, I, no, it was... I, I was quite quite honest and I also realized that as long as I could still be productive, uh, then people yeah. didn't really judge me as much as I thought they might. Now, maybe it was a little bit different when now in the last few years when I've been working with some of the people in the US. <laughs> uh, it's been there, it's a, I think there is a, a lot more of a lot more of the, the judgmental side of what you do in your private time, I think. Yeah. And, and okay, but you should qualify yeah. that though. So Roger's old company um, kind of re-centralized in a part of the United States that is particularly conservative. Yeah, it didn't re-centralize, it's always been. Well, I mean, it used to be centralized, it used to have oh, borders sorry, in yeah. Europe. They closed that down, yeah. they brought everything back to the United States yeah. and they brought it to an area that is kind of in the Bible Belt Uh, so a lot of his co-workers are, you know, work really hard and then go to church and then have five kids and uh, everything is, has to be like that. And they're very judgmental towards others that don't uh, really But live their lives. some yeah. of them were really, really nice people too. So yeah. I mean, I just didn't feel like I could really be overly honest. Uh, I mean, they would see uh, one colleague that was uh, a colleague in common while we'd be having dinners As, that would come to the bar and sit at the bar and have a couple of drinks every night uh, on his way home. And like the entire group, it was all the conversation was around Jeez. this individual, this guy, and why wasn't he home with his wife? And a lot of judgment. So, and I didn't like that. So, and they were all miserable too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
So anyway, anyway yeah. so I, I mean, I think that'll be one of the things if in whatever I decide to do next, I'll try to do something which I feel it was a good company. So I'm not, uh, I'm not blaming the company, but that I can feel like the colleagues that I'll be working with are people that I can be uh, really, and, and there were a lot of them that I could be honest with, but there were a lot that I couldn't be at this nice. last company. And I guess maybe that'll be the case if I go back into that hyper responsible, hyper professional world. Yeah. Um, when you when you consider all these things, and sometimes maybe that you miss your motivation and doing further, continue with things uh, that you have you have to do on your list and have to go further. Where do you take your motivation from? Do you have something that inspires you? When you come to a point like this? <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. I can tell you that my life has been a series of uh, fortunate accidents. I was never the kind of person that had a list of things to do in life yeah. and then felt that by 30 I would do this and by 40 I would do this. And I always felt that that was way too strict, a way to imagine life. And I think that's really been positive for me. Uh, really kind of just letting things organically happen and keep an open mind that things will work out. Um, I think what's more important to me is that I have a, a core set of values and whatever I mm -hmm. choose to do, I don't cross or prevaricate over those values. So I, I try to <laughs> make myself happy, right? I, I put that very much uh, as a priority in my life. I come from a very conservative family that was very strict and really wanted to keep me under wraps and didn't want to let me go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of moved away when I was 20. So, you know, I, I was the black sheep daughter for a few years, but that was okay because, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, you have to make yourself happy first and then everything else kind of falls into place. And After, she's also the person who's been calling her parents every day through the- I know, the, no, we're closer now that we're older the, though. That's yeah. the way it goes, yeah. right? I mean, my mom was mad at me for a few years, but then she got over it yeah. and now we're, we're fine. Um, I mean, the other thing is that I, I, I like to grow things <laughs> and I, I would like for everyone to be having their best lives. So I like to surround myself with positive thinking people, people that are like to think outside the box, people that are not all worried about what other people think. Mm. And I think if I can continue to surround myself with like minded people, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. So I don't have so much um, an inspiration to follow or uh, a goal that I want to reach next. I try to live my best life every day <laughs> and then everything else sort of kind of falls into place. That yeah. would be, I think, the best way to. My motivation, Serena would say, when we met, and this was part of the reason she was a little bit concerned about uh, getting it serious with me, was uh, I used to wear a T-shirt that was uh, Scrooge McDuck on the front. And yeah. do you know Scrooge McDuck? No, no, we don't know. Oh, uh, Too young. Oh, they're too Here, young. I'm gonna find a okay, so it's a Walt Disney character. It was the uncle of Donald Duck, and it was Dark, a, Dagobert. And What's his name? Because we know it as Dagobert Duck. He's the rich guy in the in the. The rich guy. Yeah, yeah. that's yes. the one. Oh, we have another yeah, so different guy. name for this guy. Yeah. How do you call him in English? Scrooge McDuck. Scroogey. There he is. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, Scrooge. It's yeah. Scrooge. You know he's called yeah. he's called Dagobert in German, <laughs> but the same. Do you, okay. How how do you call those three nephews of uh, Donald Duck in English? We you, call what? <laughs> in oh, Italian, no. Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Yeah, and in Italian it's different too. And in German it's Tick, Trick, and Truck, Truck, oh, Tick, yeah. Trick, and Truck. What? <laughs> what? The sound the ducks make. Yeah, right? yeah. Quick, quick, quick. So so anyway, the right. back to Scrooge McDuck on the shirt. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> She thought I wanted to make a million dollars. No, no, you said it to me. Oh, uh, maybe I did. Maybe <laughs> I said it. He was like, he was 19 and he said to me, by the time I'm, what, 25? I don't know, like, by the time I'm 30, by I wanted time to I'm be born, a million. I want to make a million dollars. And I was like, oh, God, that guy, okay. I wasn't so, too impressed. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so... It ended up that uh, I definitely was going that way and, and buying into all of the, the, the idea when I was at the first accounting firm, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized that the other people who thought that way, and some of them became millionaires by the time they were 30. They went off to uh, the Caribbean and, uh, and, and did things. 
Okay. One of them, one of them was a decent guy. The other one was a horrible guy who left his wife at the uh, altar and a bunch of different things. But these guys were not the people that I was trying to be like weren't nice people. And I realized that. And, and I also realized that that wasn't making uh, that part wasn't making me happy. And as soon as I did that, and like I said, I did fairly well through my time. I kind of got there anyway, but I didn't have to sell my soul to get there. And, yeah. and, and that was, that was really important. So now when I'm thinking about everything and even the way that I, I said, I didn't, I wasn't really myself all the time, but I was also somebody who would talk about uh, politics with my colleagues who were very right wing. And when I was in North Carolina and talk about things that I thought were important about social justice and things mm -hmm. like that, partially because we, we uh, talk about a lot of these things because of sociology and, and whatnot, but I have my own ideas that way. And I wasn't afraid to, to say that. Now, I think that will be my motivation going forward is to always, like you said, live kind of uh, a truthful best life, uh, do the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And, and I think that really is what makes you happy. And if at the same time you can end up being financially comfortable or yes. in a good relationship and all these types of things, maybe it's not a coincidence, right? Maybe it's because you are a good person. Uh, and when yeah, I was... You're being a bit wishful thinking that. No, because when I was <laughs> let go from the company, I had this outpouring of people who really reached out to me and said how... how shocked they were and how nice a person and what a uh, productive relationship had been. And that was worth so much to me. It, mm -hmm. it definitely made the idea that the company made a, a decision easier to take by knowing that people appreciated me as a person. Mm -hmm. So if I had been a bad person and, and then had this happen to me, it, I don't know how I would deal with it personally. It would have been a whole Right. For sure. so, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, I remember my, my uncle in Australia, um, he always said his whole life, uh, my grand uncle in Australia, he always said his, his whole life that he, um, he never left a job um, where they said like, ah, oh, screw you, go away, or like, you know, like where they, where they were like, um, he, he always tried to leave a job, um, uh, like, but like people talking about him in a good way and it doesn't matter even yeah. if he hated the job he still wanted it to be like this and i think this is really important to just end a chapter and start something new because otherwise you're always running uh like you know you know like catch up with your past or whatever um so yeah, yeah cool, thank yeah. you very much it's really really nice words and um really interesting and inspiring yeah. so i think we get to uh, our last couple of questions now yeah. And um, uh, like one of uh, one of our questions we always ask our interview guests is um, imagine um, you um, would be because we are with unpopular people here. That's the name of our uh, our podcast and our, in, uh, our show. Um, so imagine you would be popular. So we would, you would be well known in the whole world. You would have like a massive influence. There's so many people listening to you have like a trillion follow us on Instagram. <laughs> Most of them are fake. No, just joking. Um, <laughs> I'd have to have an account. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just uh, just imagine you have like a big influence. Um, like, uh, for example, for Serena, it would be like, um, like you, you would, uh, I don't know, publish a book. Everyone wants to know about sociology and everyone's listening. To it. What would be, what would be your message or like whatever you're, Roger, <laughs> you, you, you have your own company and you have like so many people like you create a new Facebook oh or something. What would be, what would be your message to the people if you would have like this influence yikes this is a really hard question what to do because you know i always joke with roger that i need another nine lives because i want to do so many things and i have so many million interests that it's hard to pick i think okay given the, the situation we find ourselves in you know what i would love to be because i mean this is like sci-fi right i can invent anything i want uh, you know star trek the fundamental premise of star trek uh, the dream that the maker of Star Trek had, his name was Roddenberry, was to basically create this uh, uh, globalized world uh, with a interconnected government uh, that would resolve all the pressing issues. So disease, famine, uh, precarity, education. Um, so I would like, if I could be whoever I wanted, I would be probably a, the politician that makes that world order possible. That would be my absolute dream 
Um, I think if, if you think of um, someone that is doing similar things, though, in, in a smaller field, Bill Gates has made all his billions of dollars, and now he's put that aside, and he wants to try to resolve a bunch of health issues globally by putting his money at work and by creating all these global networks among scientists to mm -hmm. share their knowledge so they can come up with HIV solutions, malaria solutions, sanitation solutions. So that's the kind of thing, if I really had the ability and the power, that's something I'd like to do. Yeah. Shit. Now, now, <laughs> I I, now, it. now, I now it. I've got to answer the same question. <laughs> I had the best answer. Well, you don't have to change anything. If you don't want to change anything, you don't have to. <laughs> no fucking pressure. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you can be Trump's assassin. <laughs> I'm sorry. I say it out loud. No, I'm not the man on the, the grassy knoll. Um, I... Uh, I, I really do uh, think about a, a lot of the ways that we could do things differently in, um, in business uh, from the point of view of um, being much more alt uh, altruistic and, and looking at ways that you can make money but also be altruistic. Uh, and I think I even wrote it down in, on a plane in my phone at one point. It was... Uh, It was something like altruistic capitalism or something like that. So it's maybe a step off of what Serena is talking about from the point of view. But having uh, kind of a secondary, uh, secondary set of books that looks at how much good that company has done for the world, right? And, and docking it and taxing it if it's not doing good things for the world. And, and trying to figure out, and there was uh, a movement uh, around um, sustainability talking about the triple bottom line and things like that, but it lost a lot of steam around uh, things that now uh, through activists like Greta and other things like that mm -hmm. are starting to come back. And I think young people are going to make a, a big difference. But I think if you could really have that as a kind of a guiding principle that would stop certain types of um, capitalism from happening because they aren't towards the greater good of the world, mm -hmm. that would that would that would be something that I I know it's a, it's a lofty goal. Uh, right after I solve uh, and, uh, world hunger, world hungry, <laughs> hunger. And uh, and figure out peace in the Middle East. I'll do this, but uh, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. It, I'm glad that we have a couple. <laughs> but I but I really do think that there is a way after this that governments are going to have a a bigger role in what is right, and it's not all going to be about uh, the financial Process. generation. Um, but you need to start looking after the weakest in uh, in the world and. I really worry about my friends in the U.S., and I'm I'm very critical of Trump. But I think the biggest concern I, I I have is that it is going to get much worse, and I hope that it doesn't get much worse there, because there is there and here in in Canada a lot of income um, inequality, right? And that drives a lot of these these big kind of social problems, and we've done it largely because. People want to make as much as they possibly can. Back to Scrooge McDuck. What was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dagobert. 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 There you go. That's a good name. Yeah. Thank you very much. So there's no right or wrong answer to this. So um, because it, it's just gathering ideas. That's why we ask this question. It's just for because everyone says something different, you know. So it's just for us. It's just um, we, we get so many different ideas from so many angles and so many different people tell us something different uh, so it's uh, your answer was beautiful as it is and um, yeah we just uh, just thank you thank you from my side <laughs> um, now um, we come to a question we always ask it has to do with the education uh, system and um, imagine you would have a school and you could select the subjects so this means There have no subject that exists. So something you want to teach children or um, young people what they have to learn in life. What subjects would you implement? I get to go first this time. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, 
I, I'm, uh, I think maybe a, a product of my time right now, but one of the things that I think is scariest is uh, the level of, um, the level of, la- uh, the lack of capability we have around self-sustainability. Mm-hmm. And so the whole idea that a lot of kids uh, really don't know how to grow vegetables or uh, don't know how to so uh, do the things that would have been taught at one point in Canada in home economics, which was very sexist when it was done. So <laughs> another thing is all the, the program would have to be completely without this whole idea that boys do one thing and girls do another thing. Everybody does exactly the same thing. All the boys learn how to cook. All the, the, the girls learn how to do change carpentry and, and change a tire. And, and I think that is one of the things that I, I hope after all of this, we realize we've gotten a little bit too far away because of the modern supply chains and things like that, that you don't know where your food comes from. You don't know where things come from. And and I think that's a big part of what needs to be in some kind of education uh, and educational system for kids so that they understand that. And, mm-hmm. and I know some, some schools do that, but I think we've moved too far away from that. Yeah, for well. sure. Cool. Oh, thank you. Mine? Okay. She's probably got a longer answer. I, no, no, it's not. It's not going to be long, actually, because it's something that I'm, I'm kind of cooking in my mind already. I think what we need is... Um, is maybe not a school, but a course on happiness. And there's been some interesting things done in this area. You need to bring together a bunch of different expertises. You need the neuroscientist. You need uh, um, somebody that works in health. You need the sociologist. Uh, you need somebody in arts and you need somebody in history and then somebody in philosophy. And basically what you would do is you would spend a bunch of time going to see happy people and figuring out what makes them happy and experiment with all sorts of varieties of happiness and then try to distill the lessons out of these people's lives. I think actually with your blog, you're trying to do exactly that. So it's really cool to see. The Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I think the first important lesson I think we get out of this is that happiness comes in many versions and possibilities. Another is that... Um, Sometimes we're unhappy because we have ex- traumatic experiences that we can never know to deal with, and therefore we end up stuck in a rut. That's why it's so important to talk to somebody in health and neuroscience. And there's ways out, right? There's psychological techniques to kind of re-educate the way your mind works to make you get out of those nano modes. And the other one is that... Um, and it's kind of, again, saying that it's not money that's going to no, make you happy. No, absolutely. I mean, people All think that right. being... This is why I love so much the concept of your blog, right? You like this idea of unpopularity. Everyone assumes that you, we need to look at the superstars or we need to look at the powerful people yeah. to figure out happiness. But that's still not true, right? It's actually, I think, very much the other way around. Yeah. yeah. So there, it's a short answer, but I think that's we should study happiness. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if people want to find out more about you, um, is it um, okay if um, if you do you want to share any any way of contact, or do you want people if they have any questions about sociology or about your project, should they contact us and we forward uh, forward it to you? Um, uh, what? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can give you an address. Or yeah, I mean, we want to keep this. Uh, let's see how it turns out, but. We may not even necessarily want our full names. I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. Yeah. So let's. I mean, let's this see. was a pretty. I think it was a pretty. Yeah, it was a. I think it'll be great. I think so it'll be great. I don't but, think there's any part of this that gives me any issues. But yeah, so we're not. Uh, no worries. Yeah, the other thing is, yeah, I don't know. It's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to email people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe not the email address. Yeah. yeah you no. can. The people can yeah. contact us uh, via our website and send us a message, and we will forward it to you, and then you can decide. Yeah. And if there's any profile, Perfect. and if there's any profile <laughs> you want people to follow on, uh, we can add it to the show notes. You just tell us afterwards. Yeah. And um, okay. Cool. So thank you very much for your time. Um, we we wrapped. Oh, wonderful. We That's wrapped this up um, so far. Fun, and we say um, from our side, we say goodbye now. And um, yeah. 
So. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great inspiration, I think, for many people because um, the motto of our podcast is listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. <laughs> and yeah. Serena helped us with this phrase, to be honest. <laughs> yes. And yeah, it was like you learned a lot in this interview. And thank you very much for your time and all the inspirational words. Awesome. Oh, great. Thank, thank you thank so much. Part of it. Yes. And if uh, you want to, um, you have some final words you want to say for our guests, now at the time. <laughs> um, yes, travel. Travel as much as you can. Yeah, after all this is, uh, is better. Wait for it to be safe and then yeah, travel. Yeah, wait for it to be safe, but travel, meet people. God, I hope we can, but hug people be be really genuine and and you'll meet some of the most wonderful people uh and sometimes it'll be in the strangest circumstances uh, so yeah uh, you just open yourself up to uh, meeting great people the cat wants to say hi hello, <laughs> hello <kid. laughs> all right thank you very much yeah thank you and bye bye Thank you very much for listening to this inspiring interview with Roger and Serena. We hope you enjoyed it. For the show notes to this episode, have a look on our website www.unpopularpeople.com. It would help us a lot if you would share this episode with your friends and family. Thank you in advance and bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>